So this is Smedent tutorial. And in today's presentation, we'll be talking about the fundamentals of chest X-ray reading. The fundamentals of chest X-ray reading. As you're preparing for your licensure exams, it's expedient that you know how to read your chest X-ray because you might get it as a question, either in Viva or even in the written part. So please, let's get interactive and then let's learn one or two things. Again, by no means am I a radiologist. No, I'm not a radiologist. I'm just a doctor who is just finding ways to help. All right, good. So let's begin. If you are new, you might want to subscribe. And if you're enjoying it, please just like and share as well. All right. So in this presentation, we'll be talking about an overview of the chest x-ray. We'll talk about radiographic densities, orientations that are used in chest x-rays, differences between PA and AP x-rays, how to approach a chest x-ray film, quality of a chest x-ray film, uh, anatomical landmarks on an AP x-ray, and then finally we'll talk about reading the x-ray using the A, B, C, D, E approach. So I don't ready, please. You should be able to know all of these things. All right. I believe you're getting excited, right? So am I. All right. So overview of the chest X-ray. Now, understanding and interpreting a chest X-ray is a very valuable skill, given on how commonly it is ordered nowadays. All right. So even though it's normally supposed to be read by a radiologist, but sometimes you wait for them for hours, for days, and even I mean, weeks <laughs> and results are not yet in. <clears throat> so you just have to know how to read it to save your patient. All right. Because the whole idea is to help the patient. Right. So please. But there's some things we'll get to understand that will make it easier for us to do that. Okay. So if you know how to do it, Charlie, kudos to you. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. So let's learn one or two things. All right. Now, this imaging modality works by literally penetrating the human body with x-rays. So we just subject the person to rays of x-ray, all right? And then we record the findings, just like the people camera. I believe you remember the people camera, your physics. All right. Now, if the x-ray penetrate a structure, they will appear as black on the film. And if they can penetrate the structure, they are deflected. So they are reflected and they then appear as white on the film. All right. So it's basic. This is basic. This is basic. All right. If the x-ray cannot penetrate through it, it will be white. If it can penetrate, it is black. It is black. All right. So radiographic densities, radiographic densities. Now, what is an x-ray? An x-ray is simply a dark and white film that correlates to about five different areas of density. White and black film. So I believe in the olden days, we used to have a camera, okay, that will give you white and black, right, picture. Yes, I think they are using, maybe they are using x-ray, the idea of x-ray to do that. And even those days, we used to watch black and white televisions. Who knows? Maybe they are using this x-ray to, to give us uh, a somatic view of things. <laughs> All right. So back to our discussion. Now, what are the types of densities we might be looking at in this kind of stuff? So we have black, which will give you, which normally is an air. So when the x-ray passes through air, it will give you a black shadow or a black color. And then we have dark gray, normally through subcutaneous tissues or fat. We have light gray, soft tissues like the heart, the blood vessels, and so on. We have off-white. So your bones, like your ribs, your clavicle will be seen as off-white. And then we have bright white metals, like metals. All right. So I'll show you how it is. So look at this. Look at it. The radiographic what densities where we have air, we have fat, we have the bones. Look at you see bones is white. Now look at this. This is the pacemaker. 
All right. You see that there's difference between the white. Yes, this is bright white and this is off white. So you can see all the bony structures are white in nature. And then the things that allow something to pass through are like dark, gray, you know, all of the kind of stuff. So having understanding of this is important in you reading your x-ray. Okay. Now let's talk about the orientations that are used in x-rays. So for orientations, we talk about basically three things. One is the PA view. That's the posterior anterior view. So in this view, the X-ray source is positioned so that the X-ray beam enters through the posterior or the back aspect of the chest and exits out of the anterior or the front aspect. Okay, where the beam is being detected and recorded on a film for us to be able to read it. All right. Now, this is the preferred imaging orientation. All right. This is the preferred. However, people who are bedridden will not be able to do this kind of what x-ray for us. And that will take us to the next type of orientation called the AP view or the anterior posterior view. But basically, this is what I mean by uh, posterior anterior view. So basically, this is somebody who is standing here and this is where the source of radiation is coming from or the source of rays is coming from and then over here we have our film we have our film all right all right all right and this is the preferred one this is the preferred one so what are that the other alternatives we have the ap view all right so like i said if patient is too unwell to stand then we'll go by the AP. We'll go by the AP. Used for very ill patient. Now, it is important to note that the left side of the image, so when you are looking at it, the left side of the image for both AP and AP films represent the right side of the patient. Very important thing you need to note. So when you look at the when you are looking at the film or the image, the left side. So let's say your right side, you, your right side, is the patient's left side. The same is applies to the opposite side. So your left side actually is the right side for the patient. I believe this is fundamental and you get it. So there is it. Patient cannot stand, so he's lying down there. We have put the film at his back. And then the source of radiation is just above him as he's lying supinely. Basically, basically. All right. Still on the orientation, we have the lateral view. Okay, that's I said we have three. So the lateral view makes it three. So with the lateral view, it is not used alone. So it comes with either a PA view or an AP view. Okay, and the reason why we add the lateral view is because it helps us in cases whereby we cannot localize the pathology with just a single view. Okay, so with just AP or PA, maybe you can't find the exact place where the problem is happening. But if you take the lateral view, at least it helps you to pinpoint exactly where the pathology is. So it's very, very good to have a lateral view as well. So this is our diagram to tell us. So the A is, now for now, we'll, we'll go into the difference between the AP and then the PA and how to know whether this is an AP or this is a, a PA view. We'll go through it, so don't be in a haste. But basically, the idea why I brought the picture is to show you the lateral aspect. So this is the lateral. This is the lateral aspect. This is the lateral aspect. You can even see the how nicely the, the vertebras are. Look at it. The vertebra is looking so beautiful. Looking so beautiful. All right. So now here comes the differences, okay? The difference between the AP and then the PA. So good. So we have this at our disposal. Very nice diagrams, right? Very nice diagrams. So we can tell that the first diagram we showed you was actually like a PA view, right? Like I said, it is the commonest. It is the commonest. 
All right, we only do the AP when the patient cannot stand. All right, all right. And then one of the reasons we will illustrate over here. So what are the parameters for differentiating between the AP and then the PA? And if you are given an X-ray, sometimes they don't give you, they don't tell you whether it is an AP view or uh, a PA view. So you have to tell just by looking at it. And we have some parameters to look out for when you are going to do that. So one of the parameters is the clavicle. So you use the clavicle as a landmark to be able to help you. All right. So the clavicle is usually all over the lung field in a PA view. And then when you take the AP view, it is above the, ape, the heart apex. So now let's look at it over here. Look at it. This is the clavicle. Very nicely. Clavicle. Very nicely. You see it is coming into the heart. Sorry, into the lungs. So it has, so we say it has covered the lung fields or it is over the lung field. Look at this. This is also the clavicle. But you see, this is where the lungs are. Right? So this is just above the heart apex. That's why we say that the clavicle will be seen over the lung fields in an AP view and to be seen over the heart beat, the heart apex in an AP view. Some books will say it is more horizontal on an AP chest view. And I kind of, I don't disagree, right? So you call it, it looks like it is transverse in nature compared to the clavicle that are seen on the PA uh, view. So very, very important. So use the clavicle to help you with the differentiation. Then the next parameter is the scapulae. All right, the scapulae. So in a PA, the scapulae are moving away from the lung field. They are moving away from the lung field. And then in, uh, in the AP, it's like they are moving towards the lung field. They are moving towards the lung field. And this is where the scapula is located or where it is located. Good. Another aspect to use is the rib or the ribs, the ribs, the ribs. So in a PA view, the ribs are more distinct. And then in an AP view, the anterior ribs are more distinct. They are more distinct. Don't worry, we shall, we shall have another, uh, we'll get on that slide where we'll talk about which one is anterior, which one is posterior rib. So don't worry, don't worry. You're covered. Okay. So, and then one last parameter is the heart. So the size of the heart is very, very important. And in AP view, it is relatively enlarged. The heart is relatively well enlarged. This is the same patient too, but look at how the heart is, the size of the heart compared to this area. This one looks more enlarged than this one. Again, we'll do the reading, we shall talk about how to do this. All right. Now you have your x-ray. How do you approach it? How do you start? Where do you start from? Very important. So first and foremost, you have to start from the patient's details. And this deals with the patient's name, the age, the gender. And then you also have to look out for where it was taken and then the date or the time. Okay, for example, an X-ray that was taken like a month ago would definitely look different from an X-ray that is taken maybe today. The same patient, it will be different. Uh, to be different. So you have to be able to know when the patient took that X-ray. It's very important so that you don't go and give drugs you're not supposed to give. Okay. So the first thing. And the next thing that you have to do is to check for the quality of the film. Quality is important in the sense that if the film is bad, you might end up getting wrong uh, diagnosis. 
So it's good that you have a very a good film. So it's not every every place that you do your X-ray. And sort of fact, some physicians will tell that, oh, go to this particular place, go there, go here, go there, because they believe that these people give them a very good or a quality film. So it's not everywhere that you have to do your X-ray or you have to request uh, for X-ray. Okay, go to a facility or a private place where they do quality film. All right, but what are the things that you look out for to assess the quality of the film? There's something you need to look at for, and that brings us to what, what we call the RIPE, R-I-P-E, RIPE, where the R stands for the rotation. So you need to know if the X-ray is rotated or not. Because rotation can affect the result. The inspiration, did the person inspire very well before the X-ray was taken? If not, it can also affect your reading. The projection, in what view is it taken? Very important. And then exposure. Some books will add or we say penetration. All right. So exposure, penetration, they all mean the same thing. So it's like the rays, how much of it entered, basically, or was exposed. Very important. So you need to note all of these things. So if you have assessed your quality and you say, oh, now this x-ray is good, to read, then you move on to what? Reading it using the A, B, C, D, E approach. A, B, C, D, E approach. Basically, that is how to approach your chest x-ray film. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the quality of the film. All right, so the quality of your x-ray. We talk about the rotation or the hour. So in rotation, you have to ensure that the spinous processes lie halfway between the medial end of your clavicle or the clavicle, the medial end, the one that joins the manubrium. You must make sure that your spinous processes are lying in the middle of it. Very important. Now, the reason why it has to be so is because if the x-ray is rotated, it is difficult to know if the trachea is deviated by a disease or not. Because if you rotate the x-ray, the trachea will also rotate or it will shift. But you know, shifting of the trachea gives you a lot of differentials, right? So you must be certain that, oh, this x-ray is not rotated. And hence, this deviation is as a result of this disease or that condition. If not, you're misdiagnosed. So it's important, it's important. What else? It is so difficult to know the size of the heart. If it's deviated, it changes the, 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 the size of the heart. It will change it. Depending on which area it will go, it will change it. All right, but you want to be uh, as accurate as possible, isn't it? Because it's patient life, whatever you do, will determine what you're going to do to the patient. Or whatever you say, we determine what intervention to do or to use for your patient. So it's very, very important. Very, very, very important. All right. So basically, this is what we mean by rotation. All right. So looking at this x-ray over here, this, or this yellow uh, colored here is what? Your clavicle. And these are the media ends of your clavicle. So like you can see, this over here is your trachea. Can see it over here, your track here. Nicely, nicely, nicely. Your carina is somewhere here. It's nicely, yes, something like this. So now we are saying that your spinous processes must be in the middle. All right, now inside it, you can see some something like a dot, isn't it? These are spinous processes that are being seen on the X-ray. So you can see that it is lying in the middle or halfway between these two. And that is a good X-ray, right? I mean, it's a good orientation. So it is well rotated. So it's not like it's bad or something. The patient is standing right. 
good. So with this, you can go on to assess the rest of it. So the rotation, taken care of. So again, what do you do? The clavicle and then spinal process. It must be in the middle or halfway, basically. That will, not, okay, rotation is good. So you move to inspiration, right? So under inspiration, what is it? So normally x-ray is done during inspiration with good inspiratory effort. So you have to breathe in. Then we take it. Pam. As simple as that. As simple as that. So it's very important to inspire very well before an x-ray is taken. Now, how do you know? Because you're, you're, you're not there when the person was breathing in, isn't it? But as a clinician, how or quote-unquote a radiologist, how will you know that indeed there was a good inspiration? So you use the number of ribs to help you. Okay. The number of ribs to help you. So anterior, you should have about five to six anterior ribs. And then posterior, you should have about eight to ten in the mid-clavicular line. Mid-clavicular line. All right. Mid-clavicular line. Five to six anterior, eight to ten posterior. As simple as that. As simple as that. Now, if it is less than that, we say there's what? Incomplete inspiration. All right. And if it's more than that too, we say there's what? Hyperinflation. So whatever be the case, you must get a good amount of what? Air in the, in the, in the lungs. And you know, the, the lung system is an air field cavity isn't it? So you want to make sure that you inspire adequately so that any area that needs to be covered with air is covered with air. So that if there's a place where there is some sort of, you know, opacification and things, you can clearly see it. Otherwise, it will be difficult. Otherwise, it's going to be a difficult task for you. So you have to ensure that everything is right. So the inspiration, you check it. And so you look at, check the reps and all kind of things. So how are you going to do that? And that is where this picture will help us. All right. So we have been fortunate that they've labeled all the uh, vertebral column. The vertebra, they've labeled it for us T1 up to T12 for us. Very nice, very beautiful. So now, always, in reading x ray, you must first of all identify your clavicle. Very, very important. All right. Which, when we go to the ABCD, we'll talk about it. So you see, this is your clavicle. So you take it out. You take it out, you take it out, you take it out. Fantastic. Fantastic. And then, so luckily for us, the labels are here. So you see over here we have the, so these are the anterior what, ribs. So we have it here. We have it there. Third, the fourth, the fifth. Okay. So now we say what the mid-clavicular line. So if this is the clavicle, Maybe we make a calculation should be somewhere here, right? Maybe somewhere here. So good. All right. So even though we can see, so this is the sixth anterior rib, right? We can see the seventh. We can even see the eighth. It doesn't mean that this person has over inspired or something. Or it has that means he has under inspired. Just because you have seven or eight or over, because you have more than maybe seven. No, we said mid-clavicular line. So six and maybe seven, right? So that means this is a very good x-ray for us in terms of inspiration and even in terms of what? Rotation, right? Mm -hmm. Very nice. But the focus here is on the what? On the ribs. And then you can use the other side to also do the... The, anti the posterior ribs, all right? So look at it. Sometimes you might not even see the first one, okay? But it's also there. So you might not even see it. Then we have this, okay? Then that. And so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. So they are there. And we said about eight to 10, isn't it? Again, made clavicular line. Made clavicular line. So you see, you can have it there. Very beautiful, very beautiful. So this is how to differentiate between the anterior ribs and the posterior 
ribs, anterior ribs, and the posterior ribs. So here, uh huh, this one, good. This one was anterior, uh huh. So this is the posterior. I think it's it's beautiful, right? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So basically, to know it, you know, when you inspire, so it's like the the posterior ribs will be upwards, upwards and outwards. Up and out. Up and out. So it will go up and then out. That will give you the the posterior ribs. Up, out, up, out. That's how I used to know which one is anterior, which one is posterior. So, and of course, the opposite will be true for the anterior ribs. All right. Please, I'm not a radiologist. All right. I'm just doing my best to explain these things. All right. So, if you're out there and, you know, you have some, you know, a better one to share with us, please feel free. Let us know in the comment section what you think about it. All right. We are all here to learn for our patients, basically. Good. So again, the quality of the film projection, like I said earlier on, is going to talk about what the AP or the PA view plus the lateral view. Then exposure. Exposure, we are talking about the penetration. So a well-penetrated or a well-exposed X-ray, you should have the spine faintly seen behind the heart. Faintly seen behind the heart. Very, very important. So please take note of that as well. All right, now, if the film is under-penetrated, then there will be an excess of white present. So when there's low penetration or low exposure, there'll be excess of white present. So one can tell if the film is underpenetrated if the thoracic spine cannot be seen through the heart. If it cannot be seen through the heart. Very, very important. Alternatively, if the X-ray is over penetrated, what happened? There will be excess of black. There will be excess of black. And how will you do? do how will you know that? So, in an over penetrated film, there will be what? You will have landmarks that are decreased or absent. So you might not see some landmarks on the X-ray. All right. Good. So this is what I mean. So we have the low penetration, and then we have what? The high penetration. So look at the low penetration. You see, we cannot really, really, really see the spinal cord or the spine. You can see it clearly. All right. So that's what we use to know if indeed this is under uh, exposed or under penetrated. And then we now have the higher one or the high penetration. Look at, look at how black it is. You might even think this person is having what? Any motorax, right? Maybe. Okay. Or maybe not. <laughs> so again, that tells you that. And look at it. You, know, you can't really, really see some landfills over here. There's supposed to be some things over here. But you can't even see them. You can't even see. You can't see. You can't see it. That's why we say some landmarkings are decreased or absent. Decreased or absent when it is overexposed. All right. Good. So before, now we have understood that the quality is good. And the next point is supposed to talk about what? The reading, right? But before the reading, let's look at some anatomical uh, markings on an x-ray. So just take a, a minute and look at it. Very nice. Very nice. So you see your trachea, beautiful. Your heart, right atrium, your ventricle. Okay. Your diaphragm, diaphragm. So this, uh -huh. so over here, this is the costophrenic. This over here is the costophrenic, costophrenic, costophrenic angle. Yeah, costophrenic angle. This space. So basically, this is just it, right? Very beautiful, very beautiful. 
Good. So now reading the x-ray using the A, B, C, D, E. Reading the x-ray using the A, B, C, D, E. So first of all, the A stands for airway. Airway. So when you start, now the film is good. When you are starting airway, start with the airway. So the airway, you're talking about the trachea. You're talking about the carina. And you're talking about what? The bronchus. So you look at the x-ray. You ask yourself, can I find a trachea? Where the trachea is it deviated? And by now, so this is where the orientation comes in, right? If it is not orient, uh, orientated, it is not rotated to any direction, what will happen? It will mean that the spinal processes are in the middle. Am I right? Uh -huh. So if you see any deviation, you can easily tell that this is because of that or that or that. Very lovely, isn't it? So now, when you have a pleural effusion, the trachea is pushed to the opposite side. So, pleural effusion, trachea is pushed to the opposite side. And if you have pneumothorax, and I think this particular x-ray is for pneumothorax. All right. Look at it. See the lungs here. You see, you see the, the, the exposure here and here looks the same. Okay, up to this line. You can see some demarcation over here. Mm -hmm. And all of the, they're all the same. But this part looks a little bit darker, right? That could be an indication that there is what? A pneumothorax on the left. Oh, God, I said the right side of your image is started with the left side of the patient. So there could be what? A pneumothorax on the left. And that is where your clinical history is important so in the history was there any form of trauma like rta road traffic accident or anything that tells you that mm, i'm suspecting this and that's why it's always good that and that's why i think we will be the best judgment of this x-ray than a radiologist because radiologists don't really really know the history but we have the history so it's easy for us to diagnose. Easy for us to diagnose. And maybe to help them, that's what sometimes on our x-ray forms, they say brief history. But sometimes we don't even write it. <laughs> All right. But basically, this is the reason why. So that they know that this is what they should be looking at for. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. All right. So when the lung is collapsed, however, the the trachea will be pulled towards the affected side. So you see that even airway, airway alone has given us a lot of differentials <laughs> or a lot of conditions that can happen. So it's very good that you go it systematically, step by step. So your A is done. All right. Now let's talk about B, your breathing. Some will also say the bones. So if you see a, a bony or a fractured bone, definitely you will see on the x-ray, you will see the clavicle. You look at the clavicle, you look at the ribs, especially the ribs. Because if you are involved in an RTA, one of the things that we are afraid of is that your rib will be broken because your rib serves to protect the lungs. And now here's the case, there's now a fracture. It can even puncture the lungs. And that is another case we don't want to experience. So it's very, very, very important that you know all of these things. You make sure you clear it out that indeed there's no broken uh, rib or clavicle. All right. But again, you have to look at what? The lungs as well or the lung field as well. And one of the things to look at for is opacity. So you're looking at the lungs. You're looking at, is there any opacity? When we say opacity, that means white color. Okay, white color. So white opacity on the lung field will suggest a consolidation. It will suggest a consolidation. And you, at least, you have your differentials for consolidation. And one of them will be what? And pneumonia. All right. Sometimes you can also see some rings on the lung field. And that suggests cavitary what? Lesions cavitary lesions. 
then you can talk about the bat wing appearance on an x-ray and that tells you that the patient is suffering from what pulmonary edema from a heart failure most probably from the left heart then you can also have some bilateral chest infiltrations or even chest infiltrations very very common again if you have the history it helps you a lot for example if a sickle cell patient comes to you complaining about chest pain and all that one of the things that comes to your mind is what exactly acute chest syndrome and how do you diagnose that one of the things that patient is a cell with genotype ss right and then there is chest pain or there is there can be fever or even no fever all right but clinically the most important thing is what an infiltrate or new infiltrate very 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 important new infiltrate very important all right so if you have a bilateral chest infiltration again it tells you that acute respiratory distress syndrome is setting in so you know what to do all right and then i think in, in the last slide i talk about costophrenic what angle costophrenic angle so the angle between the rib and the diaphragm very important so if it is absent again it gives an indication that you are dealing with what pleural effusion all right and then sometimes you will see an air fluid level air fluid level that means air and fluid air and quote unquote water okay so again it tells you that it's what pleural effusion plus a pneumothorax all right so the diagram here so you know first of all i don't know maybe because of the way i, I put it but the, the trachea looks a little bit tilted so did the trachea the track here it looks a little bit what tilted right i mean deviated it could be the the orientation very important it could be the orientation mm -hmm. so because of that too you see how the lungs is look at it very big you see very big very important however where i want to focus your mind on is this you see this place looks a little bit what white or there's what white opacification and even look at over here and even somewhere here these areas and even look at this over here so the hilar area too there are some opacification but the pronounced one is here uh the right loop the right loop so there's opacification on the right uh loop very important to figure it out right so again this could be a sign of what consolidation so from your clinical history and everything you can be able to pinpoint what it is all right so i was telling you guys about the bat wing appearance so look at it this is the x-ray but you see it is looking like a bat looking like a bat hence the name a bat wing appearance bat wing is the same x-ray you see bat wing appearance is there uh -huh. and that is telling you that there is what some fluid in the lungs so pulmonary edema all right all right so you see he also has to, to rule out a lot of things or rule a lot of things right very good very good now we move to the c c talks about the heart so the assessment of the heart size that is what c will be telling us and over here you have to calculate the cardiac thoracic ratio abbreviated as ctr cardiac thoracic ratio and this is simply the ratio between the cardiac width and the thoracic width usually it is the maximal size or the maximal distance that you use so the longest let me put it that way all right now a normal heart size should be less than or equal to 0 0.5 or 50 percent less than or equal to 50 percent now this uh, assessment or the ctr is normally done in a pa view remember that in a in an ap view we said 
the heart will be relatively larger. So if you are using the one to check, you might have a misinformation, right? Uh -huh. You might have a misinformation because generally it will appear larger. All right. So basically, this is how to do it. This is how to do it. Practically, is how to do it. All right. Now, over here, there's two ways. Some people will prefer to draw a midline or a line here. So when you say midline, the, the vertebra, okay, or the spine, you draw a line through it. An imaginary line, basically, an imaginary line, straight line for that matter. Good. And then you see, this is the, this is how the heart is. Uh -huh. Good. And then over here, we have this. Good. Now, this is it. Like I said, in measuring, you use the one with the maximal distance. And over here, you can see from this curvature, maximal distance is over here. So again, you draw an imaginary line downwards. Or you can just simply measure from here, okay, from here to here and record it. So this is it. So you record it. And then again, using the same imaginary line over here, the midline, you are checking for the longest or the maximum distance, which is over here. Okay. And then again, you can draw or you can measure it. You can measure it over there. And then you add it two together. That's all. All right. Or you can just, since you have found that this is the highest point, you can just draw an imaginary line over here. Okay. And over here, since this is where your point is, draw an imaginary line over there as well. And then the two ends of it, you can even do it over here. It doesn't matter. So you see over here to here, or even over here to here to give it the same length, right? Uh huh. So that's it. They got the word the C or the cardiac size or the cardiac length. And then you deal with the thoracic width. So over here, from the inside of the vertebra, sorry, inside of the ribs or the thorax. So this is the inside. And this is also what the inside. Look at it, the inside. So you also calculate it. And then the ratio between them or C over T, basically, C over T. And we are saying that the answer should be less or equal to 0 0.5 or 50%. I hope this one is clear. All right. Please, if you have any question, feel free to let me know in the comment section and I can either reply you or do a new video if you want me to. All right. But so far, if you're enjoying it, please just hit the like button or, you know, show some love. All right. So we are done with the C. Now we have D, the diaphragm or hemidiaphragm. All right. Now, normally you should know that the right one or the right hemidiaphragm is usually higher than the left one in a normal x-ray. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, if the diaphragm is flattened, okay. Now the diaphragm should be in a doom shaped doom shift. However, if it is flattened, then you are thinking of what? Hyperinflation of the lungs, which is very, very common in people suffering from COPDs. All right. So you see the diaphragm is also giving you some diagnosis, right? Good. And again, normally, you can see some gastric bubbles or air shadows on the left side of your x-ray. Okay, which is normal. However, if you see these air bubbles under the right side, please, you are looking at pneumoperitoneum. So we say air under the diaphragm, the hemidiaphragm. That is a subjective of what? Pneumoperitoneum. And that is telling you that there could be a perforation. Maybe, again, the history is important. Maybe the person had typhoid fever or the person had what? Some ulcer, and now complication has set in. So it's very, very important that you know your clinical history 
before you read the x-ray. So very, very important, you see. So now look at the diagram over here. It's simply telling you, look at the diaphragm, okay. There's air here. Over here is normal, there's also an air. Over here is normal, and that could be the stomach, somewhere there. All right. Mm -hmm. But over here, it's not good. It's not good. It's not good. This thing over here, it's not good. It's not good. It's not good. All right. All right. Again, look at it. Uh, beautifully, 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 beautifully. Yeah. Oh, what am I doing? I'm spoiling the thing. Uh, anyway, guys, don't mind me. All right. So you see your clavicle. You can see some ribs. All right. That is by the way. So that is D. That is D. That is D. And then E is what everything that is left. Every other thing that's left. Sometimes you see some lines. You see, I saw uh, one diagram where there was a, a pacemaker, right? So you see that it was very, 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 very uh, opaque or opacity. The opacity was very, very high. Mm -hmm. You can see them catheters. You can see gastric tubes, etc., etc. You can see them passing through it. So the E stands for what? Every other thing. All right. So again, I'm not a radiologist. All right. I'm just trying to help out. So if you are enjoying it, please like, subscribe, and share. All right. And again, if you want more of these things, you can find them on medentweb.com. Medentweb.com. Some people want me to do ECG for them. All right. Let me know if you also want us to talk about ECG. All right. And I'll take my time and then we'll stay there and come and also wash ourselves. All right. Good. All right. So basically, this has been to the end of the presentation. And I believe you learned one or two things. Please don't forget to ask your questions, share something, your idea. I mean, let's learn. Let's learn together. But most importantly, help me share it. So thank you and see you in my next presentation. Bye-bye.